So if we just move into and start with the virus, a lot of you are very familiar with how the virus looks. It's this non-enveloped uh, uh, icosahedral structure with a circle of DNA inside. And of course, papillomavirus is a parasite, and so they have to get into a cell to cause disease, to cause problems for the cell. Now, I'm going to start just by giving you a little bit of background, and I find that one useful way of indicating why papillomaviruses do what they do is by considering their origins. And this is just an evolutionary tree of different species. And the current thinking is the papillomaviruses evolved. They're epithelial viruses, and the current thinking is they evolved as the epithelium changed between the branch point of amphibians and reptiles. And an ancestral version of an epithelial virus appeared at this time, uh, an ancestral papillomavirus. And this ancestral virus has evolved with different species as they've evolved. And with very limited species-species transmission. So you find there's some sort of fledgling ancestral papillomavirus here, which has evolved in different ways with a different species. And we now find papillomaviruses in lots of different types of organisms. And because they've evolved in isolation from each other, they've worked out different ways to live in the epithelium. Now, they all live in epithelium, and they all live in differentiated epithelium. And the differentiated layers of the epithelium is necessary for these different viruses to complete their life cycle. And they use different ways to do it, and they have picked up different tricks. And we're, of course, particularly interested in the human viruses. Now, when you look about look at viruses which have evolved in this way, viruses which have evolved slowly with their hosts. What you usually find in this type of virus evolution is you end up with viruses which are well adapted to their host. So they've had plenty of time to work around the host. And in many cases, you find that viruses like this have a very good balance between the host and the infection. And so in many cases, these viruses don't cause problems for the host. So you find that you can go into zoos and take swabs of the skin from lots of animals, and you find papillomaviruses viruses without apparent disease. They're living in the host without causing any significant problems. But at any particular moment in evolutionary time, you find some viruses which are out of sync with the host. So at the moment, we find that chaffinches suffer from papillomatosis on the legs. The Florida manatee has a problem with papillomatosis. This is widespread benign lesions. And the snow leopard has a problem with papillomavirus-associated cancers. So we get an idea these are problems which are occurring in particular species at a particular moment. Now, we're particularly interested in human papillomaviruses, so we have to take a look at these now. This is the evolutionary tree of human papillomaviruses. Around 200 human papillomaviruses known. They've been extensively searched for because they're associated with problematic diseases, so people have looked very hard for them. There's these five evolutionary groups, which are alpha, beta, gamma, mu, and a little group, the new viruses. And the most important ones are the alpha papillomaviruses, which are in the top. Now, like many people, we worked for many years on the high-risk alpha papillomaviruses, which is shown here in pink. And the high-risk alpha papillomaviruses are considered to be direct carcinogens. They can cause cancers in the cells they infect, and they cause cancers by the expression of their proteins. And it's the expression of their proteins which can cause genetic errors in the host cell. So there's a very clear link between high-risk papillomaviruses and cancers, and I'll come back to this later. But one of the things we've always been interested in it is, from a virology point of view, why the high-risk viruses need these problematic genes to complete their life cycle, and why closely related viruses, particularly the low-risk alpha papillomaviruses, don't cause cancers. The lowest papillomaviruses are maintained in the population per perfectly effectively, and what they cause are papillomas or benign tumors. These are benign epithelial tumors, not tumors which usually progress to cancers. So the difference between these two groups is very important to understand. Now, the low-risk papillomavirus, if we just extend to one other group, some of the characteristics of the low-risk papillomaviruses extend to this very large group, the beta papillomaviruses. And towards the end of the talk, I'll try and produce one or two insights into beta papillomaviruses. I'll mention these because these viruses are examples of human viruses which are very widespread, but which are not associated with any disease. So everybody's infected with betas. You're all infected with beta viruses on your skin, but you don't know it. These viruses are producing virus particles all the time. They're maintained in the population. Children get infected early in life but nobody has any particular disease associated with which is known about. This is different in immunosuppressed patients or in particular genetic backgrounds. 
where these, these type of viruses can cause problematic disease, and they thought to be indirect carcinogens. They can work in a certain way, and in some instances, they can lead to types of skin cancers. And it's a debate whether how often these viruses cause skin cancers in the general population. So let's just have a look briefly at the type of diseases these viruses cause. So I think there's two sorts of, of disease which are important. So the low-risk papillomaviruses, although they don't usually cause cancers, uh, they actually can be a problem. Viruses from this group are a primary cause of genital warts, which are difficult to treat, uh, which cause a lot of uh, uh, morbidity, a lot of uh, uh, stress and uh, problems. So they, they basically cause a lot of trouble for the people who have them, and they're very difficult to resolve. Perhaps more importantly, and this is actually a serious disease, is laryngeal papillomatosis. It's a rare disease that occurs in children. So children who have this type of, of lesion in their airway, um, they can only be treated by repeat surgery, and they need to have these lesions removed every few months. And children can get this type of, of problem, certain children, sort of in, in age two or three, and they will have these lesions for the next 20 years, and there's no way of getting rid of them apart from removing them. And even in this case, low-risk papillomaviruses can progress to cancers, surprisingly, although in a different way than the high-risk viruses. So there's a one or two percent chance that after 20 years of this stressful removal, there will be a metastasis to the lung. So it's, it's, it's actually quite a miserable condition, and there's no real way to treat it. So there's no antivirals against papillomaviruses. There's no real way of resolving these type of infections apart from surgical. Sometimes immune modulators work, but usually they're treated by surgery. They're competed by removal of the, of the lesional area. And this is the general way in which serious papillomavirus disease is treated. Now, with the high-risk virus, it's a little bit different. With the low-risk virus, it's the benign lesions which is a problem. It's the productive infections which are a problem because they persist and they cause trouble for the patient. With the high-risk virus, it's a little bit different. The benign lesions, the normal life cycle situation which the virus is caused, this is a penile lesion caused by HPV-16, and it's a flat lesion, and, and someone with a lesion like this wouldn't know they've got it. You can be visualized in the clinic with diluted acetic acid. They're sexually transmitted virus, so they infect women as well as men, and they call these flat lesions. This is a cervical lesion. So the benign lesions which these viruses cause is not a big problem. But we know that these infections are very common. There's an 80% lifetime chance of, of acquiring a high-risk papillomaviruses. And in a small number of the people who are infected, they can progress through a series of neoplasias to cervical cancer. And because these low-grade diseases are very common, the incidence of cervical cancer amounts to about half a million cases a year worldwide. So you've got these two problems that papillomaviruses cause, and most work so far has been on the cancers because of their significance and their impact. Now, just to put papillomaviruses in perspective, often uh, they're not always considered a priority by cancer research agencies, but let's just take a look at, I think they should be, because if we just look at cancers caused by infectious agents in developing countries and developed countries, overall it's around 16 or so percent. And papillomaviruses, high-risk papillomaviruses, are associated with around one in three of these, which is almost 5% of all human cancers. So one in 20 human cancers is estimated to be, have its origins in a HPV infection. So this is a very significant number. And when you think that you know, viral infections like this, they, they have particular viral antigens, they use particular pathways, you would have imagined that there would be a, quite a big effort to, to try and get therapeutics against papillomaviruses. Now, the type of cancers these viruses cause, well, the most important is cervical cancer just by numbers but they cause a whole range of other cancers too, particular cancers of the oral cavity, penile cancers, and anal cancers. Now, in terms of the current need to resolve, uh, you know, and to, and to work out ways of treatment, let's just think about how the disease is currently managed. Well, cervical cancer is managed really by preventative measures, cervical screening and vaccination. And these two methods together work to keep the incidence of cervical cancer low in developed countries. So it's estimated that cervical cancer will rise slightly in the next 12 years in developed countries because there are preventative measures, but it's not estimated to go down. And in the world as a whole, it's estimated to go up because cervical screening and vaccination are really uh, too expensive at the moment to be applied to developing uh, scenarios. So the idea that, that you know, there's a need for therapeutics, there's a need for some, some sort of way of treating people who already have the disease, the small number that progress is actually very important. Now, some of you have seen, I was going to just sort of finish the introduction by just 
saying some things about how the viruses work by just going through an animation, which some of you have seen. But I think he just sort of explains our current thinking about how the virus works. So I'm going to show you what we think, how we think the virus works from all our work, and then go into some details about particular aspects. So this is just an animation that covers various parts of the life cycle. And it, it sort of grows every year. And since I've last shown it, we've added quite a lot about latency and, and reactivation, which if I get time, I'll come to at the end. So this is a, a section through cervical epithelium. And we can animate this. And we, basically, this is how the epithelium works. So cells in the basal, parabasal layer divide, and they produce daughter cells, which are produced, pushed towards the surface. These cells make the skin barrier by a process of terminal differentiation. So they produce particular keratins, and they produce lipids, and they produce a cornified envelope. Now, the virus lives in this epithelium. All papillomaviruses live in this epithelium. And the first thing they have to do is to gain access. And as you know, papillomaviruses need to gain access to cells in the lower layers of the epithelium, need to gain access to the basal cells, because these are the cells which stay in the epithelium long term. So in the basal cells are stem cells and transient amplifying cells. The virus gets into one or more of these cells, and it converts one infected cell into a, a pool of cells on the basal layer, which keep the viral genome in them at a low copy number, possibly 50 copies or so per cell. Now, for this proliferation, as I'll come to later, it's possible that we need some components of the wound healing response to drive proliferation after virus infection. And we also need expression of these viral genes, which can drive proliferation in the high-risk viruses. Now, once the virus is in there and we've set up a reservoir of infection in the basal layer, then as these, these cells divide and are pushed towards the surface, the virus triggers this life cycle in stages. So in the lower layers of the epithelium, the viral has maintained a low copy number, and this is a proliferative phase. This is a stage where the virus can drive cell proliferation. As the cell moves towards the surface, it triggers different stages in the virus life cycle. So genome amplification occurs in the mid-regions as a result of different protein expression. And as the virus reaches the epithelial surface, the viral capsid proteins are produced. So we get maintenance of the viral genomes down here, amplification of the viral genomes in the middle, packaging the viral genomes here, and release from the surface. So this is the way the virus works in the epithelium. Now, a very important point, which I'm going to come through the, the talk, is, is some key differences in the way high and low risk viruses work, and possibly also the way that high risk viruses work at different epithelial sites. Because high risk viruses don't cause cancers at every site they infect. It's got some link between the susceptibility of the site as well as the presence of a particular virus type. So this is really a high-risk virus infection. This, this sort of thing here might be classified as a neoplasia if it was in the cervix because the virus is driving cell proliferation in the lower layers of the epithelium. So this is a neoplasia. But it's productive. Viruses are still produced to the surface. So it's a low-grade disease. Now, one of the differences we often see between the way high-risk viruses and low-risk viruses work is that the low-risk viruses don't seem to have the capacity to drive proliferation in the basal parabasal layers to this extent. The genomes are still maintained in the basal layer, but they don't need to do this proliferative phase. Now, this is very important for the subsequent risk of cancer progression, because low-risk viruses don't usually progress to cancer. It's a very rare occurrence. High-risk viruses have a much higher risk of progressing to cancer. And I think part of the reason is because they produce neoplasias rather than just warts. So warts are not considered a problem. Neoplasies are a problem. Now, if we just go to how we think he works, let's go back to a high-risk virus infection, which is here, which is a neoplasia, where we've got proliferation in the lower layers. As I go through the talk, I'll explain how we think he works. Basically, the idea is there, are, there is a change in viral gene expression or a change in viral protein function in the lower epithelial layers. And this means that the cell proliferative phase expands towards the epithelial surface. And this type of thing would be seen as a pathologist, as a higher grade neoplasia. So the cervix, this would be classified as the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grade two. So it's higher. And this would be treated because this is now considered a cancer risk. And it's thought that over time, these type of situations can lead to the accumulation of genetic errors because the viral proteins cause increased cell proliferation and prevent DNA repair. And from this virus infection, we get a cell with a different phenotype, a cancer phenotype. 
So this is the model of how viruses cause cancers, how papillomaviruses cause cancers. And now I might come back to this model later, but I think for the moment, if we just flip back to the PowerPoint presentation, I'll go to some of the techniques we use. Well, in terms of understanding how the virus works, we, we in the lab, use, use a couple of different approaches. As I'll say during the talk, one of the approaches is to try and take a careful look at clinical material, try and take a careful look at neoplasias of different grade, and try and dissect them with antibodies and with probes and with RNA mapping to try and understand the, the changes which happen as a normal productive infection changes through neoplasias to cancer. That's one strategy. And the other strategy we try and use to accompany them is to try and mimic these changes in the lab using organic typograph cultures or using, where possible, animal model systems in conjunction with molecular methods. Now, one approach which has been very useful is this one here. This, so we use a method which was originally developed by Paul Lambert in Wisconsin, where he takes a, a keratinocytous skin cell line. This is a, an immortal skin cell line. And the one he uses is a cell line called Nix. And it's immortal, but it's not transformed. So it'll grow in the lab consistently. Uh, it's genetically not so dissimilar from a normal keratinocyte. The only characteristic about it is it has an immortal phenotype. And we can put papillomaviruses into these cells. And when we do this with high-risk papillomaviruses, such as HPV-16, which is the most important one, the viral genome will be maintained in these cells. And we can do this for other high-risk papillomaviruses, such as HPV-18, or HPV 31 and 45 and 58, they all maintain very well when they put into cells in culture. Now, this is a characteristic of the high risk. I'll come later, but the low risk viruses are absolutely hopeless of being maintained. And these experiments are a lot harder. So this gives us a, a range of cell lines with episomal genes in. And the idea is that these cell lines mimic the infected basal cell we see in people. And what we can do with these cell lines is to propagate them at an air-liquid interface like this, and we can reconstruct the multi-layered differentiated epithelium, virus infected. Now, when we do this in select populations, we'll get a, a generic life cycle. Everything, all, this, all the infections will be mixed. We'll get lots of infected cells, and we'll be able to construct all the life cycle events. But when we take particular clones from the population after, after putting the viral genomes in, we find there are actually a range of phenotypes which seem linked to the way that the viral virus genome is expressing its genes. And these phenotypes range from something which is like a CIN2, an early neoplasia, which you might see in a patient, down to something which we term here a sin naught, which is something more like a flat wart. So this is HPV-16 in keratinocytes in culture and then propagate it in raft, and we get a range of phenotypes. And throughout the course of the talk, I'm going to show you immun immunostains quite often. And there's two markers which we often use, and here stained in red and green. And the two markers are in red here. It's a protein called MCM. And that's just a marker of cells which are in cycle. So the cells are pushed in cycle by the virus, by the E6 and E7 genes. And we mark these cells by staining with MCM, and they're shown here in red. And the other one we stain here is, is in green, which is a viral protein, a viral late protein, which marks the onset of the late phase of the virus life cycle, and that's the viral E4 protein. So many of the stains will be stained with red and green, and will be MCM, a surrogate of E7 and E6, and E4, which is stained in green. Now, you can see that these two look quite different. I just want to go into a little bit more detail about what we think is happening in these two. Actually, now I've put up on the, on the screen 16, 16 of the clones. This one is quite a rare one. So when we just look at the difference between these, so this one, there's extensive cell cycle entry almost to the top of the raft with very little ability of the virus to move into the late phase of the life cycle. And that's typical of a high-grade neoplasia. Not extremely high, not SYN3 or cancers yet, just an abnormality. On the other hand, this one is more like a wart. If you look at the basal cells, there's very little cell proliferation. This is a very rare type of clone. But in real life, we see this type of lesion occasionally where the virus is doing very little to the basal layer, although the viral genome isn't up here in, in these cells. 
But as the cells differentiate, they eventually trigger cell cycle entry and virus production. So these cells are producing virions of the surface, but not very much proliferation of the lower layers. And the amount of virions that this type of lesion will produce compared to this one, which is slightly higher grade, this is a CIN grade one, is actually very similar. But one has a proliferative compartment in the lower layers and one doesn't. So this work really has gone on to try and look at why this is happening. And, and our conclusion really, when we look at the cells which form these type of rafts, is there are differences in viral gene expression between the cell clones which we pulled out. So the cells which give rise to this sort of benign, um, low-grade lesion have very low levels of E6 and E7 by comparison with the cells which produce the higher-grade disease. And in general, the cells which produce the higher-grade phenotypes have, have higher levels of E6 and E7, even than the SYN1s. And the important thing is the E6, E7 levels are high when the cells are very packed up. So as the cells enter confluence, the levels of these viral genes become very noticeable <coughs> compared to this. And, and we, we suspect that this is what's driving the phenotype. Now, another characteristic, when we come and look at the growth characteristics of these cells, is that the ones that give these type of phenotypes grow in tissue culture beyond the normal confluence level. So the ones that give these phenotypes grow in tissue culture up to confluence and then tend to slow down and grow the rest. The ones which give these type of phenotypes, which are the higher E6 and E7, are, are able to grow beyond the normal confluence level. And if we just look at how these cells look, well, the ones which give the low-grade phenotypes look like this. They, they're quite, still quite large, a lot of cytoplasm compared to nucleus. The ones which produce the higher-grade phenotypes, well, they grow to a higher density. They become smaller, the cytoplasm gets smaller, and you can see mitosis as the cells. So these sort of cell characteristics are very similar to the characteristics we see in patients with CIN1 and CIN2. So it gives us a possibility to consent consider how are these changes coming about. So let's just look at, take a lesion now. This is now a patient biopsy and stained with MCM. And if we divide it into the different disease states, you can see really what I mean and how these, these type of raft phenotypes mimic it. This is an area, this is an area of uninfected. So there's no st very little staining. This is a cellular protein, so there's a little bit of it near the basal layer, but it's weak. If we look at the low-grade disease, the low-grade neoplasia, well, the cells are still quite spaced. You can look at the density of the red staining. There's lots of black in between. If you get to the high-grade disease, then the cells are much higher packed. None of these are cancers yet. They're just different grades of neoplasia. This one would be regarded as a precursor of cancer, and so that's probably the reason why this, piece, this biopsy was taken from the patient. Now, we've been very interested, and I've got a several projects in the lab, and what I've decided to do, I've just pulled out one or two images from uh, work of students in the lab just to indicate the type of thing which we, we're doing. So we know that basically the work is suggesting that changes in the level of viral genes or changes in the level of the viral, changes in the activity of the viral oncogenes are related to the phenotype we see in terms of neoplasia. And so we're very interested at first sight into which of the viral genes may be leading to this or primarily driving these phenotype changes because we see both E6 and E7 elevated in the higher grade neoplasia phenotypes. And there's two types of experiment here. They're quite crude experiments, but what we've done is grown the cell lines, grown the cell lines, uh, grown cells in medium with growth factors or without growth factors. And the cells grown in medium with growth factors, we're presuming have some resemblance to the basal cells of an epithelium. So the basal layer of the epithelium is in close proximity to the dermis. The dermis provides the basal cells with growth factors, and this is part of the reason why the basal cells are proliferative. So if we grow cells with different viral genomes in the presence of growth factors, what we find is this type of thing. The black is uh, basically an empty cell. The, red ha the green has E7 in, which in the presence of growth factors doesn't seem to make a massive difference. The one with red here has E6 in, which makes quite a big difference to growth, both pre and after confluence. And the one with purple has E6 and E7 in. So in the presence of growth factors, the idea is that the cell already has a lot of signaling to growth, to grow. So the, the viral proteins like E7 can't make much of a difference. But for some reason, the viral E6 protein does make a difference. And I'll come to our suggested reasons why this might be in a minute. If we grow these cells in the absence of growth factors, well, 
they still manage to progress. This is the, the parental cell with no viral genes in. Here, we put E6 in, it doesn't make much of a difference. So for the cells to grow, they do need some degree of, of pushing into the cell cycle. But the idea is that in the absence of growth factors, which really mimics the situation better in the upper layers of the epithelium, in the differentiated layers of the epithelium, you need E6 and E7. So you have really an important function for E6 here in driving cell proliferation uh, in, in lesions. And the E6 protein is, is every bit as important <coughs> as the E7 protein, which has very clear cell cycle entry functions in driving cell proliferation. Now, there's many possible mechanisms which could, could be mediating this. And, and I think the route we're taking is to consider that the cells with E6 in particular grow past the contact inhibition phase. And the, the presence of E6 in, in some way subverts the normal cell contact inhibition. And what we would say about neoplasia is, is neoplasia is nothing really more than just a pile of cells, a pile of cells which are driven into cycle, but can also go through cell divisions. And we would argue that as, as the levels of E6 increase, we, there's more and more ability for the cells to go through cell divisions in the higher layers of the epithelium. So, I just want to summarize basically just this little part of it and say that the suggestion really is that we have at the moment is that E6 and E7 levels or their activity determine the neoplastic phenotype following infection. And changes in E6, E7 activity determine disease grade. This is not cancers yet. This is just things the virus can do. And from our RAF culture, we managed to get up to a CIN2 with just the virus. In real life, the disease progresses into SYN3 and cancers, which we can't do with the virus alone, which fits with the idea that you need the virus and then the accumulation of genetic errors to reach cancer. And I think the other thing which we're interested in is while E7 can drive cell cycle entry, the suggestion really is the high-risk E6 is possibly necessary to drive cells through continued proliferation. Now, I know a lot of people here are experts on E6, E7, so I don't want to say too much more about that for the moment. But our thinking really is under what circumstances might E6, E7 expression be deregulated. So we're thinking about why these viruses cause high-grade disease. And then we go and have a look at where disease occurs. And if we just look at the incidence of cancers at different sites, we come back to this idea that the epithelial site is very, very important. And we come back to the general idea in tumor virology that tumor viruses are only a problem when, they become, when their gene expression is deregulated. So if we look at the cervix, we find that all cervical cancers, which is half a million or so cases, are caused by papillomaviruses. And this is a very high number compared to the number of penile cancers, which is only 40,000 or so cases a year worldwide, and only half of those are caused by papillomaviruses. So we get an idea that the site really makes a big difference, and there's something about sites in the cervix which makes them particularly susceptible. Now, this is our current thinking. We know the cervix is, is a complex site with many different types of epithelium, and we know that most cervical cancers arise from this region here called the transformation zone. And this is a region of epithelium which was once a columnar epithelium, which changes at puberty to be multilayered. And so it's a plastic type of epithelium which can change from columnar to multilayered and back. And most cervical cancers arise in this site, so we suggest the bad site is the transformation zone, and I think this is widely understood. But we're also really suggesting that viral gene expression can be problematic at this site, and this really what underlies cancers. Now, just recently, there's been a couple of interesting papers by Christopher Crumb's group in the US, which has suggested there's a, a particular type of susceptible cells here called junctional cells at the very junction between the columnar epithelium where cervical cancer might arise. And the suggestion is that those cells are a, are a cell where expression may be bad. And I think from some of our work, we would suggest that certain HPV types, such as HPV 18, might have particular problem in glandular cells. So just take a look at this. Now, this is the other type of work which we do on clinical lesions. This is, a, this is a biopsy from a patient now. This patient was treated because they had a CIN grade two, and they're treated by a cone biopsy. So that's, that's a removal of the whole transformation zone surgically. And once you remove the transformation zone, the risk of cancer is effectively gone. Now this is a H&E image, and before we did the H&E image, we did an MCM stain. It's a little bit weak in this picture, but the blue is a counter stain for DAPI. The basal layer runs down here. The, the transformation zone starts around here. It's marked by the presence of these glands in the dermis. It runs down here, and this is an area of disease, 
This is an area of CIN grade two because you can see the red MCM staining. And there's something else here in the, this gland. Now, the type of approach we do to try and understand this is to use a laser capture microscope to cut out pieces of epithelium and to capture them in a tube. This piece of tissue had two HPV types in, and we find that HPV 51 is here in the SIN2, and there's H HPV 16 here in this glandular region. And when we look very carefully at the pathology, it's a totally proliferative region, so there's very little differentiation. And you can get, get the idea, you can follow the idea that actually high-grade disease may sometimes arise quite quickly following infection of certain cell types, infection of cell types where the virus can't complete its differentiation program. And we know now from vaccine studies that women can present with SYN2 very early, with only a few months after infection. And it's probably a deregulation of the viral gene expression which is causes this. And I think the, the type of work we need to do to follow this up is not just to do laser capture to look for DNA, but to do laser capture to look for RNA expression patterns and the abundance of RNA, and if we can also in the future to look at protein expression. Now, that type of work's not been done yet, but you can understand the hypothesis which underlie the sort of efforts that we, you know, it's an easy to reach there. Now, I just want to say one other point because I've mentioned the high-risk viruses. Obviously, they have genes which can drive cell proliferation, and it makes you wonder what, is, what it is about their life cycle which requires them to have this type of gene. So why would a virus, which just needs to be passed in the population, have potential oncogenes? And this is actually also a little bit surprising and hard to think about because we know the low-risk viruses, which cause warts, get by perfectly well without having such problematic genes. So let's just have a look at these two. These are now two lesions from the cervix to the same site, two different viruses. This is HPV-16, this is HPV-11. And the key difference between them is this HPV-16 lesion, well, they're both making E4 in the upper layers, which is the green stain. They're both completing the life cycle. But this one, HPV-16, is driving cell proliferation in the base layer, and there's a lot of mitotic figures above the base layer. So this one's caused a neoplasia. HPV-11 in the same site does very little to the basal cell, so there's very little cell cycle staining in the base layer. And it's activating the cell cycle above the base layer, so that it can make a replication competent cell in the upper layers for its genome amplification to occur. So papillomaviruses can get by as a strategy without having to drive cell proliferation. So you have to wonder why the high risk viruses have evolved proteins. So from a virology perspective, you have to wonder why, what advantage is it giving them evolutionarily that they have proteins which drive proliferation. Now, I don't know the answers and I don't think the answers are very clearly worked out yet. So I've just pulled one or two pictures from, again, a student project that we're involved in. And this sort of follows the idea that if a virus can get into a basal cell and force that basal cell to proliferate, the advantage is the infected cell outcompetes the normal cells in the basal layer. So what we've done in this experiment, we've, we've, put, we've marked a single cell green. This is an empty cell. This is just a keratin site. We've seeded it with some un unlabeled cells, and we watched how it happens, over, how it grows over time. And then we've done the same with cells containing HPV-16, and watch what happens to them. And this is actually a clone of a, a cell containing HPV-16. And just briefly, of course, if you just put a, keratin, a green keratinocyte amongst other keratinocytes, it won't necessarily grow any faster than the neighboring ones. In fact, it might grow a bit slower because of the problem with the GFP. But the ones that are expressing with HPV-16 in the green, grow a lot faster than the neighbors, and so they outcompete the neighbors. So an, an HV16 getting into basal layer can effectively cause a population of basal cells with HPV16 to emerge. Now that sounds a good strategy, and then you say, well, but HPV11 and the low-risk viruses can't do that, so how do they work? Well, when we do the same experiment with HPV11, so this hasn't got all the detail uh, you really need, but when you plate HPV11 and you look um, I can't, 96 hours later, well, the cells have hardly grown at all. And these are the difference. So nine days later, we still have this green cell sort of struggling to survive, and uh, the HV16 is proliferated. So low-risk viruses in this type of tissue culture system don't cause outgrowth. Um, and I think basically they work in a different way, and I'll come to this later. Now, there's a slight complication to this, and this is a very important area for us because when we put HPV16 and look for outgrowth, that's just a cell 
going into a tissue culture environment. In real life, the infection's occurring in a wound healing environment. And we know that in these situations, the local density of growth factors is very high because the wound has been repaired. So we have to consider this other situation. And I think there's one or two very important points coming from these type of experiments. So when we take a cell line with HPV-16 in and increase the EGF amount, what we find is the viral copy number increases quite dramatically. And this seems to be an advantage. So for HPV-16, it might get into a cell just at one or two copies. And in the presence of EGF, his copy number could potentially rise to hundreds of copies. So it may be part of the system for the episomes to increase in number after infection. There was work early in the year, or a few years ago, which said that in addition to that, the presence of higher levels of EGF around the cell change the splicing patterns. And this is now from episomes. We find that the presence of higher levels of EGF lead to an increase in the amount of E6 transcripts versus E6 star transcripts. And this was shown by Frank Russell's group from the D DKFZ a few years ago in cancer lines. So we get in the idea that it's maybe the cell type, but also the environment that the cell finds itself in is very important in affecting gene expression. Now, with this copy number increase and this, in, this potential increase in six, you, E6, you would think this would make the cells grow even faster, so they would have an even better outgrowth. So this is where I say the situation becomes a little bit more complex the more you look into these particular environments the cell finds itself in. I just want to show you this one. I'll just explain this very clearly, but the important ones are these three graphs. So the red line shows a cell with HPV-16 growing over time, and it shows its rate of growth. When we add EGF to the culture medium, the cell goes a little bit slower, but when it reaches confluence, it goes faster. So you might say, well, how can this be? You've got a bit more E6. Uh, it should just go faster in general. What we think is happening here is it's a trade-off between the increased copy number, which slows cell growth, and which the cell is a burden for the cell, and the increased E6, which is tending to make the cell grow. So I guess in real life, there's going to be some sort of balance between DNA copy number and viral E6, E7 expression, which allows a certain copy number to be established. And we suspect that this increase post-confluence is not just about E6, but may also involve E5, which changes EGF receptor density. So the situation comes a little bit more complex when we're trying to relate the things that we think are happening to real-life situations. So these results suggest, I guess, to us that high- and low-risk viruses have different life cycle strategies, and we, we think the high-risk viruses can change the way the basal cells work. The low-risk viruses don't have this capability, and this may relate to their infection of particular stem, the t cell types, such as stem cells. And the environment that the cell finds itself is, self in is very important, and I think we, we think generally about a generic cell with a virus in it, but I think it's important to consider, as we go forward now, these particular phases, such as lesion formation, also hormonal changes and maybe the situation during immune regression when cytokines may be outside the cell and that's signaling to the, the virus. So I would want to move on to two different parts of the talk now in the, in the, in the second, well, second half. Uh, so understanding the life cycle at this type of level gives us a few interesting possibilities. Uh, we know that cell cycle activity is in the lower layers and then this gives way to viral genome amplification and late events in the upper layers. And this is marked by two different stages, one where there's MCM staining and one where there's E4 staining. And one of the pieces of work we did recently with Glaxo was to make antibodies to the E4 protein. And what they were very interested in is using type-specific antibodies, which we've got here. This is a 16 one in an, in an ELISA and Western block. This is an 18-specific, and this one's a 58. And they use this really to help determine causality when they've got multiple types in a lesion. And they needed this really as part of the vaccine program. So this lesion here has a little area, little area with E4 in, which proves HP58 is, is actually active in here. This is another lesion. There's a small area down here which has 16 E4 in. This had two types in 16 and 31. And we could find the 31 region in another part of the lesion. And you can see how these can be used to aid in, aid in typing and, and, and causality assignment. I think one of the things which we've followed up on this is to now use this type of approach where we, we take a tissue section and we stain it with various different markers. And in the lab, we will do this type of approach where we 
we want to know the pathology, but before we do that, we want to know where uh, particular viral markers are, and we want to relate them to disease status. So this is what a pathologist would do to this lesion. And we would suggest that you can consider molecular markers which change according to lesion status, such as E4 and MCM, and you can combine them into a molecular pathology. And I think uh, the, the interesting offshoot for us is that as you can see, what's present to the epithelial surface here, this is the surface, and which would be taken during a, a cervical smear, has E4 of the surface when it's low grade and tends to have MCM of the surface when it's higher grade. And so the idea really, which we're now getting towards the stage we can make something of is we, instead of using a cytobrush brush to mix all the cells up during a smear, we use like a sticker to stick onto the surface of the cervix and build like a bacterial replica plate. You pull all the cells off in position and then you can stain them with antibody combinations. And if you get a little patch where there's E4, that should indicate a low-grade disease. And this will change as the disease status increases. And up to a point, this is now being used, well, at least in our test, as an aid to colposcopy. So before a, diagnose, before a biopsy is taken, a colposcopist looks at it and determines where the disease is. So this is an idea you can use this to sort of help the colposcopies not to miss anything. And in the lab, really, the idea we can, we can follow a lesion over time without sampling it. So it becomes a non-invasive sampling system. And the idea really is we'd like to use this thing to consider how gene expression changes as a result of hormonal changes. The idea that a SYN1 can change to a SYN2 and back to a SYN1 as estrogen levels change. So I hope those sort of ideas come to pass, but we'll see. So just from summing up the virus life cycle, we really get an idea that the virus has to order its life cycle very precisely and things go wrong. Neoplasia develops when things go wrong. Now, not, we've not been just interested in E6 and E7. And actually, we've been most of the time interested in the whole virus life cycle, which is, which is shown here. And I'll just summarize our thinking about this. So we've, we've really emerged over many different publications over the last five or six years. So the idea really is if we just look at this, in the lower, gray, the lower layers of the epithelium, the virus drives cells, cells into cycle and drives cells through the cycle. And the extent to which this reaches the surface is something to do with E6 and E7 activity. Eventually, if the life cycle is going to be completed, the cell has to leave the cell cycle. And, and the idea is it, it, it enters a final S phase-like state. And this is where genome amplification starts to occur. And one of the proteins we've been working on starts to build up here. This is the E4 protein, which is shown in green. And as this protein starts to accumulate, it's a small protein, but it has this sort of constrained structure. It's only 90 amino acids, but it folds back on itself like a hairpin. And the N and the C terminus have a, an affinity with each other. And this, is, this, this affinity, this structure, is modulated by the kinases, which are in the cells in the different stages of the cell cycle. So in S-phase-like state, this protein is phosphorylated by MAP kinase, which puts a phosphorylation on one side of the loop and opens it up. And this is thought to allow it to start to stick to the keratins, the structural proteins in the cell. And as the cell moves towards the surface, then the, the kinases change. And it, it's now thought really the cyclin B, CDK, puts a phosphorylation on the other side of the loop, tends to close it up again. And this makes it susceptible to cleavage by a protease, calpane, and this leads to its high abundance in the cell. Now, one of the things which E4 does seems to be to change the levels of kinases in the cell, particularly MAP kinase, members of the MAP kinase family. I'll come back to this later. But as the E4, as the cell moves towards the surface, we move into true differentiation, and it's thought that the E4 protein sort of cross-links the keratins in, in this stage and, and really damages the structure of the cell. Now, these sort of cross-links can be seen in the lab. When we just make the E4 in the lab, they form these type of fibers, which are amyloid-like fibers, and they're quite dramatic to visualize. And in the cell, what we find is these cells with E4 in, the, the, the cell structure becomes compromised, and the, the, the structure of the nucleus and the structure of the cell contacts uh, tend to be disrupted. And the current thinking really now is the virus actually adheres in some way to this sort of E4 keratin debris, and it gives it a transmission advantage. So let's just take a look in the upper laser. These are EM pictures, and I just want to show you the sort of thing. This is a cell in an E4 knockout, and you can see it's highly ordered, and the cell structures are quite narrow and quite tight. These are the desmosomes. If we look at an E4-infected cell, well, the, the connections between the, the cell and its neighbors are very poor. And if we go and do some type of raft experiments here, here we've got a, a raft, a wild-type raft with type 18 in, and what we've done is put a sticker onto the surface and try and pull the cells apart. 
And what they do is the RAF tends to break when E4 is present into single cells around the middle layer. When there's E4 absence, the RAF tends to break much more poorly and the layers tend to stick better together. And this gives you an idea that one of the components of, one of the reasons for E4 being present is that it actually does some damage, some compromising to the cell structure for extra allow virus es escape. Now, I don't want to say too much uh, more about it apart from to just go through one or two of the other things which we think this protein does very briefly. So I'm now talking primarily about E4. We think its main role is in escape and transmission. But it's been said the virus, very difficult to see with the light on, I guess. The, the level of genome amplification when E4 is gone is actually quite different. It's, it's actually reduced compared to when it's present. And you can see this in the graph. So the idea is that when, when, the viral, when the E4 protein's there, things work a little bit better, which you might expect. I just want to show you one picture because there's a lot of interesting kinases uh, during differentiation. And this is one which we've started to look at. This is an E4 knockout. And this is stained for junk kinase. And this is a wild type raft with no viral genome in. You can see that some of these cells are very positive for junk kinase. And when E4's presence, they persist into the upper layers. And many of the E4 positive cells are also positive for the kinase. This is a raft, but actually in lesions, it's very dramatic too. So we've got an activation of particular kinases when there's E4 present, which you don't find in the normal cervix. And we think this is really one of the ways in which E4 contributes to genome amplification by stimulating this kinase activity, which leads to changes in E1 phosphorylation and changes in nuclear localization. So from this part of it, we really suggest that E4 plays a key role in multiple events in the late stage of the virus life cycle. But we think in its primary release is in virus primary function is in virus lease and transmission. Now I want to move in the last 10 minutes or so um, to just talk about some final things we're doing on a different stage of the life cycle. So I've talked all about active infections and I've said some things about how we think high and low risk viruses differ and their different strategies. I want to talk about something else now which is viral latency. What happens in these chronic infections or when the virus infection is resolved by the immune system. So I mentioned earlier that beta viruses infect us all, but there's no apparent disease. And we've been, understand, we've been interested in understanding how the virus is working without causing any disease. Now, our interest has primarily started off from latency. So if you just look in now at a high-risk papillomavirus, high-risk alpha infection, well, people get infected around the time that sexual activity is initiated, and many people resolve their infections, so there's decline as age increases. But there's always 5 or 10% of individuals who are positive for HPV at, at later stages in their life. And often this positivity for HPV is in the presence of no disease which anyone can notice. So we've followed two strategies here. One, we've, we've, we've looked at clinical material. I mean, these are samples from patients who don't have disease. These are hysterectomy samples where there's HPV but no disease. And we've used an animal model. It's this one, the rabid oral papillomavirus. And the animal model system is the one I'm just going to say. What we can do here is we make lesions in the animal. These are papillomas, and we mark them with a black tattoo ink mark. And we can follow their appearance over the tattoo mark over time. So four weeks, we've got a papilloma. And then the regression starts to happen. We get lymphocytes appearing, and the lesion clears. And by about 10 or 12 weeks, there's no lesions anymore, but we know where the lesions used to be. So we can go and say they're latent sites, and we use a laser capture approach to cut out uh, different pieces of epithelium. And in, in the majority of the epithelium above the tattoo, we can find viral DNA in the absence of, of lesions. So the viral DNA can persist in the base layer even after the lesion's gone. And I think this is one aspect of viral latency. And when we immunosuppress the rabbits, this just shows some rabbits where we've reduced the T cell count with cyclosporin. We can get an increase in some instances in viral copy number. Now, they're difficult experiments to do, so I don't want to say too much more about them. I just want to say one final thing where we've got an explanation of how beta viruses might work. So, so beta viruses exist without apparent disease, and you might say, well, they're latent. I can get DNA from my hand because I've got latent beta virus infections. And I think latent infection where there's no virus production is one form of persistence. But I think there's another form, and I'll just go and mention this, and I think this is often what the beta viruses do. So beta viruses are not a problem unless you're immunosuppressed, and this might happen if you're immunosuppressed. 
And you can look at these type of lesions and do your staining. This is obviously just a, just a wart. It's got lots of pathological features of warts. And it has all the stains, like I've said before. It has a lot of E4, this time shown in red, and the m stem is shown in green. And if you look at these type of lesions, you find the characteristics of low-grade disease usually. This is now keratosis. And when we look at the markers, it's caused by a beta papillomavirus. And one of the characteristics is there's little cell cycle activity in the basal layer. So a little bit like HPV 11 wart, a little bit the way low-risk viruses work. They stay in the basal layer, but they don't cause a lot of cell proliferation. And they reactivate all this as the cell moves towards the surface. Now, this type of lesion, this one has been, this patient resolved by, this was a skid patient who was resolved by a bone marrow transplant, and the lesions were resolved. So people like this are very useful to understand where the virus is gone. Uh, and you can take punch biopsies from cooperative patients. Uh, and when you take punch biopsies around the hair follicles, hair follicles are very important sites because one way of looking for papillomaviruses, which had been very prevalent over the last few years, is to take plucked hairs, particularly eyebrow hairs. And in, a, in an average eyebrow hair, you might find four or five beta viruses at the DNA level. And then the question is, what are they doing, and why is the DNA there? And this is a punch biopsy from a hair follicle where we were suspecting to find beta viruses. So the nice thing for us is that it looks apparently normal. This is the hair follicle. This is the this is sebaceous gland here. This is some normal epithelium. This is the hair, which would be growing out here. But when we stain it with markers of the virus life cycle, we, we find that the virus is actually living in this hair follicle. This is MCM, so the, this is a bit like a, a low-grade MCM here. The red is E4. The virus would be being produced towards the hair. And the idea is that the virus might stick to the hair, and as the hair grows, it comes out with viruses on it. And over evolution, the sort of thinking is that furry animals transmitted viruses like this. So if you go into zoos and find viruses on the fur of lots of koala bears or kangaroos, uh, we, the suggestion is they might be coming out on the hairs like this. And it also suggests a different way of entry, that the entry through a wound may not be the only way, and entry through a hair follicles are possible. A uh, very interesting point is that beta viruses are occasionally associated with squamous cell carcinomas, and there's a lot of debate about whether they cause the cancers. This is the squamous cell carcinoma, and it's actually got a hair follicle in the middle of it. And this was positive for beta virus, and we can see when we stain, this is beta virus E4, and this is the cancer. So it's either the cancers arising in the vicinity of the lesion or, or the lesion was in some way predisposing to the cancer development. And when we look at a whole range of different types of lesion associated with beta viruses, well, we occasionally find cancers with beta viruses in, but often we don't. Now, just the final slide. So why... It's a question really is, is, can beta viruses really be associated with cancers? It's clear that they're found in the vicinity of cancers in some situations. And it's clear that the higher infectivity and the higher activity of beta viruses, such as immunosuppressed or in patients with a genetic susceptibility, such as EV, have cancers more frequently. And in some settings, such as EV patients, the link with cancers is, is quite well established. Now, what we find is that Unlike HPV 18 or 16, where you find bits of HPV DNA in the cancer, so the causality is much, much clearer, we don't find in beta viruses the, the beta virus still in the cancers, and that sort of raises doubt about whether they've caused it. But I think the beta virus is from the molecular. There's a reasonable suggestion that they may work by a hit-and-run strategy, and it's probably the, the most plausible case for a hit-and-run strategy amongst viruses in general. There's no real proven hit-and-run strategies. For, there's no prov viruses which are proven to have a hit-and-run strategy, but I think the betas are, are high contenders. So I just want to show you this one. When we put HPV 18 into our NIC cells and passage the NIC cells over time, the viral genome is very easily maintained. There's no reason for it to go. The genome gives the cell an advantage. You remember when I said put HPV 11 in? HPV 11 is very difficult to maintain. Well, it's the same with beta viruses. They're very difficult to maintain. And I think they've not evolved to live in a rapidly dividing cell. So there's no reason why they would be expected to be maintained in a, in a rapidly dividing cell as the cancer progresses given that the way they thought to work is to prevent apoptosis and proper repair early on in the cancer progression. I think it's hard to prove it for certain, but the fact that they, they may have evolved to work in a different way and they have genes which prevent uh, proper DNA repair and, and prevent normal apoptosis 
does suggest that they may, in some cases, have a, have a role in cancer progression. So I'll just leave that and just say about latency. Well, in apparent infections, as we look at them, comprise a number of things. They can comprise true latency in the basal layer, and that's where the possibility of reactivation. So that's one reason why you might be DNA positive but no disease. But I think they can also comprise the presence of micro lesions, such as that one in the hair follicle. And I think regressed lesions can actually reappear as micro lesions if your immune status changes. So I'll just sum up, not about beta viruses, just the current thinking about alpha papillomaviruses and high risk alpha papillomaviruses. And say that, well, a productive infection from any virus, any papillomavirus, really is an, effective, an infection of the epithelium where gene expression is controlled. It's, it's how the virus has evolved to control its genes to produce virus particles at the surface. And the suggestion is that high-risk viruses at some sites don't always get it right, and there's a range of gene expression problems which are just down to viral gene expression, not about secondary changes, which are manifest as SYN2 and SYN1 or productive infection. So these are not cancers yet, but I think the persistence of a SYN2 or even the higher-grade disease like a SYN3 can lead to the accumulation of genetic errors, and this is facilitated if the viral genome accidentally integrates into the chromosome in a way which allows E67 to persist. And what we don't really know that much about at the moment are these patterns where this mechanism by which active lesions actually disappear and become latent, and there's very, very little understood about how the immune system really controls infection. I'll leave it to that. Um, and just say thank you for your attention. There's lots of people involved in the work over the years, some of which are shown here. And this is what NIMR looks like in January, only actually at the moment worse than this, because the snow must be another, another six or so inches high. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>